And uh, so praise the Lord. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And we want to look at uh, the message that I started a couple Sundays ago. And that is uh, glorying in the Lord. Let all your glorying or boasting be in the Lord. And there's no better way to end the year than boasting, bragging, or glorying in the Lord and all that he's done for us and all that he's done for you. Amen? What a great way to end a year. And um, the Bible, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 is where we're going to find ourselves. But thank you guys so much for your love, your cards, your kindness, your gifts, your prayers on behalf of the younger family. Thank you guys so much. Please pray for my son Dave. He's sick. Uh, hasn't been feeling well, so pray for him. He's also going to be starting college, or I should say um, uh, underwater welding, his underwater welding school. It's uh, where they teach you how to salvage uh, things from the bottom of the ocean or lakes, also how to weld uh, pipes, different things like that. So pray for him. He's excited about that, but he'll be starting on January the 5th if everything goes well. So be in prayer for him, and that'll be up in Hudson, Florida. All right, so thank you guys so much for praying for him. What's that? The third, on the third. And then pray for me because I still have a teenager at home. And uh, I pray for the rapture. Amen? All right. All right. Galatians chapter 6. All right. The Bible says this in Galatians chapter 6. Let's look at um, verse number uh, 10. And as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hand? And as many as I desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But then the Apostle Paul writes in verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and the mercy upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let's consider the subject, glorying in the Lord, boasting in him. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, I pray now with all my heart, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the salvation that you and you only provide. Lord, thank you so much for the eternal forgiveness that you offer to each and every person. Thank you for the hope and Lord, thank you for being the rock that does not change in our lives. Lord, thank you so much that we have you and that, Lord, you tell us in your word that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And we can say with confidence, the Lord is our helper. And so, Father, we just praise you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your salvation. I pray, Lord, today there'd be one or several here today that don't know you as Lord and Savior. They've never turned or repented of their sin. They've never admitted to you that they're guilty of sinning against you. And you tell us in your word clearly, for all have sinned and fallen short of your glory, your perfection and that the wages of sin is death and hell forever but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus you tell us Lord and I pray there be one here today that does not know you that they would repent turn from their sin and put their trust in you believing in your son Jesus Christ and that he died on the cross for their sins and that he was raised for their justification father I pray for Christians today that also that you would help us to remember that our focus is to be on you that, Lord, all of our strength, all of our hope, all of our help, Lord, is in you. All of our provisions, Lord, you're all are all in all. And, Lord, truly help us to focus on you. Help us to brag and boast about you. Lord, help us to be the light bearer that you've called us to be. And, Lord, let people truly see your light in us. And we just pray with all of our heart that you'll revive us, that you'll touch us, that you'll comfort us, that you'll convict us, that you'll give us whatever we need. Lord, we're a needy people today. We need your touch. We need your spirit to move. Lord, I need your touch, your forgiveness. I need your touch to anoint me to teach your word and your power. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Is the moon ever in perpetual darkness? Is there ever a time where the moon is completely engulfed in darkness? And the answer to that question is no, it's not. Sometimes the sun is so bright, where the moon is positioned that it's so bright that it just drowns it out that you can't see it. 
But there's sometimes the way the Lord made the moon, it turns it into a certain position to where when it's completely dark at night on our side of the world, now we can see the reflection of the sun on the moon. So it's not the moon itself that gives the light. It's giving indirect light, indirect sunlight that's bringing indirect light into our dark world. Well, in the same way as a Christian, God says that you're the light of the world and that when you position yourself according to the word of God and you align yourself with the will of God, then people are going to see the light of Christ in you. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So it's imperative that we truly follow the Lord and keep his will and do what his word says so that people can see that he is the light, the true light that brings truth into the world, that brings salvation into the world. Amen? Amen. Well, let me ask you a question. How is your light shining for the Lord these days? How's your walk with the Lord? Do you have a close walk with the Lord? Is your fellowship with him where it needs to be? I truly hope and pray that it is. But if it's not, the Bible says if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and that we can walk in perfect fellowship with him. Amen? Amen. So there's always hope in the Lord, and he gives to us instructions. And the Apostle Paul is writing to the Galatians. Now, Galatia was an area, basically Asia Minor, which was modern Turkey. This was the only epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote that he addressed it to other towns as well. Now, in Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem had met because there was a, a major uh, heresy that was going on in Galatia. They were beginning to teach that in order to be saved, that a person had to be first come a Jewish proselyte, and then, after they became a Jewish proselyte, obeyed all the commandments, then they could trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So the whole book of Galatians is written in the defense that we are saved by faith. Justification for our sins is that we are justified in the Lord Jesus Christ who, was our, uh, who died in our place, who died as our substitutionary uh, death in our place. So all of our hope, all of our eternity is pinned in the Lord Jesus Christ and what took place on the cross. And that's why he says, the world is crucified to me and I to the world. So if we're going to boast, let us boast in the cross and what took place there. Because it was there where all of our hope and all of our help was made uh, true. And that we truly do serve a living, risen Savior. Amen? We don't serve a dead God. No other God that's been named on the planet has ever been said to have been raised from the dead. Now, Muhammad was a prophet. He wasn't declared himself to be God, but he was Allah's prophet. But he was declared to be raised from the dead, but not Allah himself. Now, only our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been raised from the dead and is now living and sitting at the right hand of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, when you consider glorying in the Lord, man, the Word of God has a lot to say about boasting in the Lord and why we need to have our boast in him. And why we need to brag in him. Because he is our life. He is our all in all. And sometimes I think, you know, we hear that, we preach that, we can think that, but we don't realize the reality of all that the Lord does for us on a daily basis. Amen? Truly. And I hope and pray today that through God's help that we'll see the necessity for bragging on the Lord. You see, Paul was writing a, a complete defense against uh, saying legalism. In other words, today we would say a lot of churches teach that you have to be uh, baptized in water plus believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. That's called legalism. And that's what Judaism is. They were trying to go about seeking righteousness or trying to justify themselves, make themselves good enough in the sight of God by trying to keep the law that the Lord gave. The Lord did not give the law to save anyone because the law itself cannot save. You cannot obtain the righteousness that's found in the law unless you live the law perfectly. And the Word of God says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's holy standard. So none of us can live to the holy perfection that God has set forth. And so therefore, the law was brought about to show us our sin, our need for our Savior. It's to lead us, to drive us to Christ, to show us how desperate we really are. In fact, Paul... Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you can see God's passion and God's heart for the gospel because the Lord even reminds all of us and says, even if an angel from heaven were to come to you 
and preach a different gospel other than what Jesus Christ himself preached, and that is you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, at least anyone should boast. If anyone deviates, even a holy angel from heaven, God says, let them be anathema. Literally, let them die and go to hell is what it means. So God puts a premium, a absolute premium, priceless price tag on the gospel because it represents his son. It represents the cost of your soul. It represents the cost of your eternity and where you're going to spend it. Amen? So Paul, you can see, is burdened. And he's saying, listen, don't deviate. Who, who has bewitched you? Who, who is trying to trick you to teach you that you can get to heaven by something that you do outside of yourself or inside of yourself? There's nothing inside of you or outside of you that can save you. In fact, Jesus says with men, salvation is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And that's when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world. Amen? Amen. Now, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 31, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. In fact, the Bible says, whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. So we are to give the exact representation of who God is. We're to be a living commercial for who he is, what he would say, how he would respond, how he would react, things that he would do. And anything short of what Jesus would do, say, respond or react is sin. And so that's why we have to allow the Lord Jesus to live his life in and through us. That's why we have to be filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit. Because we can't live the life that he demands us and commands us to live. That's why we have to allow the Lord to live his life in and through us. The life that we can't live. That is key. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 27, Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of human works? Nay, but it was excluded by the law of faith. In other words, let me put it this way. It might be easy to understand. Romans 3.27 teaches this. What then? In light of what Christ has done, in light of what took place on the cross, in light of how he took all your sin, he absorbed all of your wrath, he paid for all of your eternity in full on Calvary's cross, in light of all of that, in light of the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, you and I must understand that there is no bragging or boasting in anything that we say, do, can do, or accomplish, or have. Not one ability, not one thing we own, not one thing we have that we can brag and say that we have something to do with it. Everything that you have, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, the Bible says. Amen? Amen. The Bible says you can do nothing apart from me. You can't exist. You can't breathe. You can't take your next step unless the Lord Jesus allows it. How do I know? Because Hebrews 1 says he holds all things together by the power of his word. All things. Every atom is held together by the power of his word. Amen? And Jesus is the living word. Wow. That's why the Bible says in Romans 3.27... He eliminated our boasting and bragging on the law that's based on the faith of Christ, not based on our ability or what we do. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that whatsoever the law says, it says to those who are under the law of God, that every mouth may be stopped from bragging, boasting, or saying something they have something to do with getting to heaven, that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, and when the Lord introduced the law, the law doesn't bring about salvation. It shows you your need for salvation. But all the law of God does is stir up the wrath of God. That's all it does is incite and stir up the wrath of God. And so that's why we needed the cross. That's why we needed that substitutionary death of Jesus to pay the penalty for us that we could not pay. And if we do pay for it, we'll pay for it in eternity in hell forever and ever. And that is not the heart of God. Amen? Boy. We can boast and brag in the cross of Christ because it fulfills prophecy. It fulfills prophecy, and it has fulfilled prophecy. Listen to what the Bible says. If any man be in Christ, behold, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. Well, how can that take place? How can something become new in somebody's life if the prophecy of the cross was not true? 
How could the Lord change your life if Calvary did not take place? He could not change your life. Calvary had to take place. The death and shed blood of Christ had to take place for your salvation to be possible and for the greatest treasure of all to live inside your heart and to take up residence to live in you. Amen? Amen. Boy, talk about boasting and bragging. We need to boast and brag on him. That's why the Bible says in Psalms, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen? Let me tell you about what the Lord has done for me. Let me tell you about what the Lord has done for me. Amen? Not what I've done for myself. Wow. You see, what do you mean prophecy fulfilled? Well, look, 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 look at verse 14 of Galatians chapter 6. Notice what it says. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now that's a tall order, amen? All of the world has been crucified to me and to you if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creation. So the world being crucified to me is a miracle. Being born again is a true miracle. Do you understand that? Amen. Amen. And in order for the prophecy of the cross to have power, it had to be fulfilled. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, in order for the world to be crucified to you and you to the world, prophecy had to be fulfilled. But in order for prophecy to be fulfilled, prophecy has to be foretold. So where was it foretold? And why is it that you can brag in the cross because it fulfills prophecy? I'll tell you. It's found in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and the Bible says and I will put enmity between you and the woman now God is speaking to Satan they had fallen they ate from the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil they're in sin they're being kicked out and God comes and says to Satan and I will put enmity absolute hostility complete enemies between you and the woman Eve and between your seed Satan's and her seed Jesus and we know that her seed is interpreted in this verse in, in Genesis because Galatian tells us that her seed in this verse is referring to Christ himself. And then it says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So in other words, the cross of Christ was, full prophet, was, was foretold right there in Genesis 3.15. But however, it goes further than that. The Bible says that Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. So it was foretold before the foundation of the world even existed. And the word of God teaches us that it was fulfilled because Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross and said, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. And he said to Telestai, it is finished. The deed is done. I have paid for all the sins of the world. I have accomplished the work that you have sent me to do. Amen. And he was raised from the dead. So there is no boasting or bragging. And the very fact that the cross was fulfilled should thrill you and it should motivate you to really all the more brag on Christ because of how accurate he is. He's 100% accurate. God means what he says and says what he means. Amen? Amen? Listen to this statistic. I was blown away. Listen to this. There are over 300 prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now check this out. Here's an example of just eight of those. In Daniel 8 and 9, you can see the time of his birth. Uh, it was foretold in Micah 5.2 that he would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah says he would be born of a virgin. Zechariah says he would be trade for 30 pieces of silver. Psalm 22, verse 7 says that he was mocked. John 3 says that he was going to be uh, crucified. Uh, Psalm 22 says he was going to be pierced through our transgressions and that he would die with the wicked and that he would be buried with the rich. According to all Old Testament prophecies, that's just eight of the 300 that were given. Now listen to this. Mathematics and astronomy, astronomy professor Peter W. Stoner, praise God for men that have 50 pound brains, amen, <laughs> has made a statement that the chances of just eight prophecies like these coming true by sheer chance is one and 10 to the 17th power. That would be equivalent to covering the whole state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep and then expecting a blindfold man to walk across the state and on the very first try, find the one coin that was marked. Just for eight to come true. And all 300 plus have come true. And they're still coming true. And every prophecy will come true. So that is why you and I can boast and brag 
in the Lord Jesus Christ because he says what he means and he means what he says and everything that he says comes true. Amen? But number two, you can boast and brag in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ because it, re it reveals the passion of Christ. The passion of Christ is revealed. Look at verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except God gives us an exception. What is that exception? In your degree, is that what it says? In your job, is that what it says? Your position? In your riches, in your fame, in your fortune, is that what it says? In your ability? Does it say anything about me or you in that verse? What does it say? In the cross of Christ. Amen? Amen. John 3, 16. And for God so loved the world, so loved. What is his passion? His passion is you. His passion is me. Amen? And that should cause you to boast and brag in him because his passion 100% is completely, teetotally focused on you. Name one time, one time, even for an atom of a second. I'll give you a million dollars if you can tell me one time for an atom of a second where God was not focused on you 100% and paying attention to you. Never been a time where God's not focused on you 100%. His passion for you is always the same passion that you see on the cross for you. Amen? Amen. Wow. It proclaims the love and peace of Christ. People want peace. There's no, there's, no, there's no peace until Christ comes, amen? But if people want peace in their heart, they're not going to find it in this world. They're not going to find it in philosophy, religion. They're not going to find it anything that this world offers inside of them or outside because all of it is found in Christ, amen? Just like the moon can't shine on its own, you cannot shine on your own, and you cannot be saved without Christ on your own, amen? Amen. Not one person will step into heaven and, and whisper one atom of anything that they did to get there. Because if anyone wants to hold on to one atom of something they did to get there, their destination will not be heaven. Their destination will be hell. Because Jesus plus nothing is salvation. Jesus plus anything you add to it, any type of human work, religion, philosophy, is damnation. That's why we got to boast in the cross. Amen. It proclaims the love and peace of Christ. Look at verse 16. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy upon them and upon Israel of God. Wow. Let me, let me read a couple uh, verses that just absolutely bless my heart. In John chapter 15. If you'll take your Bible there. In John chapter 15. Well, I love this verse. Look at verse 9. It says, As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Now, Jesus is, is teaching the disciples of the apostles. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Now, think about that. How does the Father love the Lord Jesus Christ? Somebody say it. How does God the Father love the Lord Jesus Christ? Perfectly. Perfectly right? right? Man, you can't describe his love correct. Now, notice what the verse says, though. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Look at the love that God has for you. Wow. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now look, look down there at John chapter 15. And look at verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you, appointed you that you should go bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. Now look at verse 22 of 17. And the glory which you gave me, Jesus speaking, talking about the Father, the glory that the Father gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect and one, and that the world may know, listen, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now humanly speaking, let me ask you a question. Would it be easier for the Lord, God the Father, to love his son or to love you? Humanly speaking now. 
If you had to answer the question, would it be easier for God the Father to love a son, or would it be easier for God the Father to love you? What would you humanly say to that? His son, right? Boy, but the Word of God doesn't teach that. The Word of God teaches that he loves us just as much equally and perfectly as much as he loves his son. And when I think about that, that blows my mind. Why? Because I think about my sin, I think about all my imperfections, I think about all my rebellion, and, and, and yet I, I know how upset I get when I'm hurt, when people sin against me or violate different laws that they shouldn't when it comes to personal things in our lives. We can get very upset, very hurt by things that people do, and yet you think about God the Father loving you just as much as he loves his son? Wow. And all of your... So in other words, humanly speaking, you would say that God loves me more than he loves his son, but that's not true because God's love is perfect. And God loves everybody equally perfect. But humanly speaking, it just blows your mind. And no wonder, it's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Mm. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, speaking of Jesus, having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through the death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And you cannot get better than that, amen? You cannot ask for a better policy, for a better contract from the Lord for you, for your soul, amen? All of your sins have been nailed to the cross, haven't been forgiven, never to be repeated, ever to be read again. Amen? Wow. But guys, also, you can boast and brag in the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross because it proclaims our emancipation from everlasting damnation. It proclaims your emancipation from everlasting damnation. And my friend, people go to hell every single day. It's a reality. I was watching a show the other day with my brother when he was in town, and it was called The Count of Monte Cristo. And he had a friend who was like Judas that betrayed him, and they stuck him in this prison. And then this prison was in the middle of this island on a peninsula, out in the middle of the ocean. There was no window. It was just a stone-cold floor, and this man had to sleep on a stone-cold floor, no window, no candles, no nothing. Now, this is back in the 1700s. No candlelight, no nothing. Could you imagine being sentenced to that for the rest of your life? No one to talk to. In fact, the guy only got to talk to people once a year on his birthday, and then they would whip him on his birthday. That was, that was his birthday present. That's a blessing. And then to be put back in that, could you imagine that? But could you imagine the eternity in hell where there is absolutely no hope of escape? No more repenting? No more chances to get it right. Man, we should be boasting and bragging in what Jesus did for us on Calvary's cross. Amen? Boy, we should. It proclaims our emancipation from everlasting damnation. Verse 14, it says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because all of my salvation is in Him. It's not found in me. It's not found in the world. It's not found in any other person except for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Word of God teaches us in Acts. There's no other name given amongst men under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that name that was given was the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Emancipation. I looked it up. It literally means to be set free from slavery. So if you think about physical slavery, well, he set us free from spiritual slavery, the slavery of sin. And what sin does to us, it makes us, it makes us its slave. Sin it's most people's masters that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're saved, sin is no longer a master over you. Satan is no longer your master. Jesus Christ is now your owner. Amen? You see, when you get redeemed, it's a change of ownership. Satan owns you by right of sin and rebellion. But when Jesus came, he owned you right by right of creation because he's your creator. But he also purchased your soul by right of redemption. So when he delivered your soul on Calvary's cross by taking all your sin, and he literally set you free, and you are emancipated for all your sins. You can boast and brag in the Lord for that, amen? Boy, 
There's no peace. There's no mercy apart from the work of Christ and his cross. There's none. And the Bible teaches us in 1 Peter 2, 24, Christ himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By his stripes we are healed. You see, because of what Christ has done, he literally, first of all, paid for the total penalty of all your sins. Galatians 3, 13 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why? Because nobody could keep it. And because nobody could keep it, God had to punish those that broke it, which means everybody. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might become the promise of the Spirit, or salvation that comes through faith in the Lord. Wow. You see, he also set you free from the power of sin, not just the penalty of it, but when he purchased your soul, you can brag in the fact that he set you free from the power of sin. How is it that you can live victorious in this world? Why is it that 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, He who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ has overcome the world. Who's the, who's the one who's overcome the world? All of its trimmings and its trappings and all of its temptations. But he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he's the one who overcomes the world. Amen? And it's because of the power of the cross, it's the power of Christ and what he does for you, that reality that is taking place right now in your heart, if you know him, you can brag and boast in him. Amen? Boy, he sets you free from the power of sin. He sets you free from the love of sin. But ultimately, he's going to set us free from the presence of sin because the Bible says that when we go to heaven, we're going to be with the Lord, but we're also going to be with the spirits of people made perfect. We're going to be with our righteous brothers and sisters that died before us, that put their faith and confidence in the Lord. Amen. Hebrews 12, 23. We have come to the place where the spirits of men have been made perfect. You can boast and brag in the cross of Christ because it is where your emancipation from your damnation was sealed. Amen. And purchased for you. But guys, also... You can boast and brag in the cross of Christ because Christ gives those that know him and establishes with them permanent peace. Do you want peace today? Do you want peace that surpasses understanding and peace like you've never experienced or known? Then you need to know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? He is the Prince of Peace. He'll give you the peace that you need. In fact, Colossians 1.20, and the Word of God tells us that it's... Or 220, it says, It's not no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who is loving me. So it's not me that lives, it's Christ in me that lives his life in and through me. Amen. Wow, Ephesians 2, 6, Ephesians 2, verse 16 says, And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to those who were afar off. And to those who were near. Was there a time in your life where you were ever far away from Christ? Are you glad that somebody came and preached the peace of Christ, the peace of the gospel, the good news of delivery, the good news of deliverance for salvation from sins for all eternity? Amen? Boy. And guys, let me just say this. And I conclude. When it comes to boasting and bragging in your ability, your bank account, your job, whatever trophies that you may have, whatever awards you may have been given, whatever it may be, you need to take that as a tool or a platform and say, hey, hey, thank you for the compliment, but let me tell you where I got all that talent and all that ability from. Man, the Lord Jesus gave it to me. He's the one that gave it to me. So let me just go ahead and pass that on to him, amen? Because I'm nothing without him. I can't move, I can't exist. I can't do nothing without him. And guys, my friends, there is no such thing as pilfering his glory. It's never permitted. You cannot pilfer or try to steal the glory of God. And there's people that try, believe it or not. Look at verse 17. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And did not Paul bear the marks in his body? He was stoned, beaten, whipped. And what did he, what did he boast and brag in? What did he say when he was stoned to death? Most scholars believe that maybe he died, and that's when he was taken to heaven. And he was taken to the third heaven, and then he had a thorn in his side, and he said, 
man, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus said because remove this thorn from me because it's just, you know. But the Bible says he was given that thorn in the side so that he wouldn't be lifted up in pride because the revelation was just so unbelievably awesome that it would lift him up. And so he was given a thorn in the side, whatever that may be, to trouble him. And he said, I would rather boast in my infirmities than my weaknesses. Because when I'm weak, then he is what? Strong. Strong. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. 1 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory or boast in my infirmities and weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 1 Corinthians 1.31, that according to it it is written, He that glorieth, he that boasts, let him glory and boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4.7, for who, who, for who makes you to differ or to be different from one another? And what do you have that you did not receive from the Lord? And if you received it from the Lord, why do you boast as if you had not received it from him? As if you'd done that all by yourself. That's a good question that Paul's asking the Corinthians. Where is it and how is it that you received everything that you have? There's only one thing that you and me and the rest of the world have. Only one thing that God didn't give to us. Only one. Do you know what that one thing is that God didn't give to us? sin. He did not give us our sin. sin. Amen? Amen? But everything else that you have, he has given to you. And we need to be grateful, boasting and bragging people. And oh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen? And when I got married to my wife, Sherry, guess what I did? I boasted and bragged to all my friends that she was prettier than all the ones that they had married. Amen? Come on. And when something satisfies your heart, what do you do? You boast and you brag. You talk about it. When a man gets a new car, what does he do? Calls his friend. He shows up to their place and says, hey, look at my new car. Why? Because it's satisfied him somehow, some way. And whatever satisfies you, you're going to boast and brag and talk about. Amen? So if the Lord truly satisfies you, that's what you should be boasting in, bragging in, glorying in. So when people leave a conversation with you, if the Lord does give you that conversation and the Holy Spirit's in it, that person should walk away knowing more about the Lord than they know more about you. Amen? Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for this time that you give to us. And Lord, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your salvation. Lord, thank you so much that you've given us so many reasons that are, that are truly inexhaustible to boast and brag in all that you've done for us. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you for your eternal life. Lord, if there's one here today that does not know you truly, and the reality is that we're going to die, and when we wake up in eternity, our destiny is already set forever. I'm asking you today, has there been a time in your life where you know for a fact that you have personally repented of your sin and that you personally went to the Lord and that you said, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Your word tells me for all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Lord, I've sinned against you. I'm rebellious. I cannot save myself. Lord, I'm, I'm calling upon you. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I'm, I'm asking you to save me. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you were raised from the dead. I confess you as Lord. Have you done that in a real true way? Your eternity depends on it. It's not a hope so, a think so, a 99% so. No, God wants you to know that you're saved. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that you indeed are a child of God, Romans 8 and 16. Have you had that experience with the Lord? Do you know Him today? Have you repented of your sin? If you haven't done that, as the piano begins to play, I want to give you an opportunity to give your heart and life to Christ.